back in 1986, if you wanted to browse through millions of pages, you went to a library. A typical Sunday newspaper had about 40 pages. There were two TV channels, which was more than we could watch. One phone company, which we all owned, and no web, and nobody missed it. This is the story of how we conquered this information famine, how we filled our lives with new TV and radio stations, with video games that looked like films and films that looked like video games, and how we discovered that gathering news wasn't just something that they did. And this strange story begins with the birth of a little device that in 1986 was just around the corner. Shh! I can't talk now. I'm in a library. About the time this story begins, I went looking for a mobile phone from a brand new company called Aircell. The man in charge had my number immediately. Mobile phones are only for business users, he told me. Back then, you see, mobile phones were for would-be billionaires, the kind of people, actually, who'd soon be setting up mobile phone companies. Handy. Turns out we'd all want one, or maybe two. There are now more mobiles than people on this island, and they have fundamentally changed the way we interact with each other. Arrangements became fluid, cars became officers, and irritating people became, well, slightly more irritating. We were all connected to a massive invisible network, where usual network charges applied. And speaking of networks, a long time ago, in a land far, far away, my granny would post us rolled up tubes of newspapers from home, Ireland's own, nested in the Indo and the Connacht Tribune. These days, why would granny bother when she could just spam us with links to amusing websites? Now Irish people abroad are as likely to know what's happening in Dublin or Dungarvan as anyone living here. There's a strange new generation of expats, living in a world that's never really away, but never really home. Sailors on a sea of information, stranded between two shores. And where there are sailors, you're bound to find pirates. Arr! Back in the 1980s, being a pirate took a bit of effort, keeping your secret transmitter safe dodging the agents of the posts and telegraph. All that trouble so that Ireland was free to hear. Wham? Now, 20 years later, we can all be pirates, almost without trying. Have you or your family defied the law by putting a song on your iPod? There is no legal way to copy your CDs to your iPod, but then you knew that, didn't you? What? You put a whole CD on your iPod. Well, raise the Jolly Roger. You're welcome aboard. When the pirates died, new stations broke out like a rash of local charm across the dial. And changing the TV channel was getting trickier too. Two became four, and cable brought hundreds more. <laughs> Even the movies got in on the act. Quaint local flea pits became multi-screen megaplexes, but even the bags of sweets had swollen into blockbusters. And all of those voices came to teach us that the truth can be a lie well told, and a good story will always overpower mere reality. Dear three, Luke is in his kitchen. For Ireland, the birth of reality television meant a big change in the image of the Irish, from dipso bard or brawny navvy to buffed up ambisexual. Before reality television took off, Oscar Wilde was the only gay Irishman. Turns out we had squadrons of TV presenters in waiting, ready for export. But perhaps it's only fair that the Irish profited most from the genre. After all, we give the world Samuel Beckett, whose waiting for Godot was clearly the pilot for Big Brother. And when we weren't falling asleep watching people falling asleep, 
we were falling asleep to the ebb and flow of more boredom as entertainment. Rolling news. So information was general all over Ireland. We were swamped in unimaginable amounts of data. But instead of being overloaded, we became gluttons, paying up for a banquet of 400 digital channels, then finding we'd no appetite for anything but Fair City, proudly boasting of all the music on our MP3 players, but only ever listening to James Blunt. Dragging home kilos of newsprint just to throw them unread into the green bin. Also handy. But of all the technologies of the last 20 years, one stands supreme in its power and its enduring impact the karaoke machine. This little machine promised easy fun and usefully lowered standards of musicality. Friendly faces banging out the big familiar tunes. Pretty soon it was a TV phenomenon. You're a star? Of course you are, dear. We're all stars for the length of a song. And karaoke taught us what interactivity was all about, that there was a place for us in the brave new world. Look. The nice machines want us to come out and play. And their sing-along values spilled over into our news media in the form of DIY journalism. When the night was over, we swapped our mics for camera phones and karaoke journalism was born with its squadrons of eager blogs and podcasts, turning us all into cub reporters, paparazzi, spies. They were watching us but now we were watching them back. Back in 1986, they used to say, the medium is the message. These days, the media is us.